Welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Deek to Deek. In this episode, I have a chance to spend time with Wake Forest legend, Randolph Childress. Randolph and I talked about what led him to Wake Forest, what it was like playing with two other legends in Rodney Rogers and Tim Duncan. Also, the great disappointment in his life that led him to basketball, plus much, much more. Take a listen. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, go Deeks. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, this is your first time on Deek to Deek. And so uh, just to let Deacon Nation know a little bit more about you. Uh, so where were you from and what was it like growing up there for you? Uh, I'm from Washington, D.C. Um, I lived in a city until I was maybe 13, 13 or 14. And um, that's when I moved out to Maryland. I moved out to PG County. And uh, fortunately for me, that's how I ended up started playing basketball. So we know what that the journey that's taken me on. But prior to that, I was a football player. So I love football and football was my passion. And, uh, you know, it was it was you know, something I love to do. And it was a big part of what I, what I, what I enjoyed, you know, and then moving to Maryland, it was, my parents had uh, advanced in their careers and uh, my mom would work for the state department. And she, she had been there since she was 17 and we were able to, you know, move out at that time, move out of Southeast DC and move into Prince George's County, Maryland. So we got ourselves a house and uh, you know, literally up the road, there was a boys club called Allentown's boys club. And, and uh, I went up there hoping to sign up for football, but it was too late. They told me the only thing I can play was basketball. And that was my uh, introduction into organized basketball. Now, D.C. is known for basketball and in the Maryland area for producing a lot of basketball players, not many football players. There's some, but what was it about football that drew you to that first, considering that you were in that D.C. area? I was a big Cowboys fan. <laughs> I grew up in a household that was a Cowboys fan. So if you know anything about living in the D.C. area, at that time, the Redskins were a, a tough ticket to get. You know, the Redskins were really good in the 80s and 70s and 80s, and, you know, so were the Cowboys. So it was a it was a heated rivalry, but my house, I was kind of, you know, forced to be a Cowboys fan. And, uh, you know, and that was it. I mean, I just, I, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed going out with my friends and playing and uh, – it was something that I felt would, would stick with me no matter what sport I played. I never thought I wouldn't play it until I was unable to play it. And I, and like I said, when I moved out to Maryland, I, uh, I just went to a boys club and it was like, Hey, let me get you out the house. I didn't know anybody, you know, I'm just getting out there. And my mom is like, look, go out there and meet some guys. And we were driving past the field, seeing a football team out there practicing. So a couple of days, we're still going back and forth. My mom worked in the city. So I'm getting up riding to school and back and forth with her. And, you know, we, we go out to the field one day and they said, hey, you want to come out and play? I'm like, yeah. I met a couple of guys, you know, when I eventually started school. And the guy's like, come on out. I get out there and, and uh, you know, they were like, hey, it's too late. <laughs> and uh, you can't play, you, you know. So they told us the only thing you can play is you can sign up for basketball. And it was kind of my mother was like, look, you got to get out of this house. You're not driving me crazy. So <laughs> you signed me up for basketball. And, and, and that, that's where it began. That had to be the greatest rejection in sports history. <laughs> <laughs> when you consider that's right up there with Jordan not making yeah, his high yeah, school I, team. I, I don't know if it goes that high, but it, it it was not. You know what? It was back then. You know, in our generation, you play so many sports, right? You play. Yeah. You know, you played a lot of things all year round, but football was the one that kind of resonated and stuck with me. And so I had never played basketball other than playing with my friends, playing pickup, playing in the streets, things of that nature. And, you know, it was just like, hey, you know what? You just – I loved – I was a huge Isaiah Thomas fan. I used to sit out there on the on – on I live – when we moved out there, I had moved maybe – I was in walking distance of Friendly High School. And so they had outdoor courts that were two blocks from my house, and I could just walk up there and just play on the outdoor courts. And that's what I did. I went out there and pretended I was Isaiah Thomas. You know, and uh, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> who knew where it would take me? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously glad I did. So making that transition to basketball uh, as a young teenager, what would you say attributed to your, your, just your ultimate development? I mean, it was very quick. You went from just picking the game up to 
you know, just excelling very quickly. How was that? How did that happen? You know what? It's something that stuck with me to this day. And when I, in coaching or teaching anything, it, it was something that just jumped out. I, I tell anyone that asks me, no matter what the sport is, no matter what they're doing, I'm, all, I'm big on telling them you don't learn any bad habits. And I was fortunate enough that the coaches that I be, played with were huge. They were huge fundamental coaches. And they were just like, you know, form shooting. And that's something that I do to this day. Like if I was taking a kid in the gym, the first thing I'm doing is teaching him how to shoot. I'm form shooting. You know, I'm lining up his feet, I'm, you know, elbow, follow through, everything. And that was the way we started practice. You know, I, I remember one day I walked in and, and uh, I was in ninth grade. I walked into a, to a gym and, you know, you, like typical gym, you do it. You see it all the time. Kids go in and they're shooting around. So I go in there one day, we're all messing around and the coach comes in the gym and he loses his mind. Like he runs us for the entire practice. He was like, don't ever come into my gym without, you know, working on something. You guys spend this 10 or 15 minutes before pre-practice goofing around. We're going to have over 100 practices. So that's 100 times you can be working on something to correct, something that you all need to get better at. And so he started giving us stuff. He's like, you want to learn how to shoot? Let's work on foam shooting. He said, we got, we don't have enough baskets. We can foam shoot on the wall. It's even better. Ball's going to bounce back to you. And that's what I did every day. So when I first started playing, I, I was taught the fundamental way of doing things. And then it just became, you know, you kind of added on from there. And so you know, when you started learning that and learning footwork and understanding and trusting it and working at it as, as much as I did, then certain things seemed to come easy, but it was a lot of work put into that. Oh, I know you put in a lot of work, but but come on, Randolph. I mean, you went from just picking up the game at the Boys and Girls Club yeah, to yeah. your junior year, you're playing on a televised game right. against Bobby Hurley and St. Right. Anthony's. I mean, right. come on now. That's a, that's a lot in terms of your growth and and development uh what opened the door for you uh that created those opportunities in terms of just growing from from basketball again you went to one of the best high schools in the country uh at that time that was just nationally ranked what was right. that like to be a part of well you know that was when i thought it got serious so i moved around i bounced the backs like i said i moved out to maryland when i was 13 or 14 so i'm in middle school then right and then now i i was going to start my freshman year back in the city. Okay. Then we move again and we're back out. And I spent my freshman year, I ended up staying and going my freshman year friendly high school. And uh, I was there with Dickie Simpkins, who was a, ended up being a first round draft pick, went to Providence, all, you know, fellow classmate, all met guy. And during that time, it's funny is when I met Charles Harrison, uh, because I, that when I moved out to Maryland, you know, I played boys club. That's how I ended up meeting that following year it was my first year playing AAU. And that was the, probably one of the bigger things that happened in my life at that time, because I met my childhood basketball rivalry. And that was, you know, it was uh Carroll high school, but it was long. It was Lawrence Moton and uh, Charlie Harrison, you know, Charlie Mo, who obviously came to wake yeah. because of our friendship. But I ended up playing with him AAU and that's where I met him and Grant Hill and those guys. And we ended up playing and winning the nationals and, uh, playing on Grand Hill, you know, Grand Hills team one back then it was so different, you know, than it is now. Everybody couldn't have a team, you know, you had to win. And if your team didn't go, you got to select two players out of the region. So we, so Grand Hills team won and selected Charlie Moore and myself as the two players to go with them. And then we ended up going out winning the national. So that was a big thing. And it was, you know, so I was so excited. So you playing with guys like that, you started to, to believe like you belong. And uh, it happened so fast. I mean, I was still the youngest guy of the group, and I, it, it, it just took off for me. You know, uh, one thing I could naturally do, I was always a scorer. I didn't know how to play the game. I eventually had to learn how to play the game, but I could just score. I just sat there and just I learned how to shoot it, so it became somewhat natural to me. So moving up, fast forward to my freshman year again, I played JV. You know, uh, I didn't I didn't start anything like that with varsity. I, I backed up. We had some really talented team at Friendly High School. And uh, my sophomore year, we moved again. And we moved out to Clinton, Maryland as a sophomore. And I went to Gwen Park High School. And they had just won a state championship, but a lot of their guys had left. And uh, I walked into school. I don't know anybody again. And, you know, they have the announcements on the PA, like, hey, come on out. We got basketball tryouts. And so... I go out there and 
one of the guys that was a senior, and I'm a sophomore, one of the guys, <laughs> and a call will probably see this and get on me, but he he challenged me one time in front of everybody, so it was a big deal. So I come in there, and everybody's like, ah, oh, this young guy's pretty good. And he's talking trash to me. And I'm like, man, you crazy. I ain't backing down from nobody. Like, I know I can play. So he challenges me in front of the school, kind of carving out his territory. And we played a little one-on-one -on -one game. And so, I'm, you know, I'm a trash talker. And so I, I, I ended up winning the game. But the coach, who is George Leftwich, who's a great coach and a great player, you know, if anyone from the D.C. area would know who he is. And uh, he was my head coach then. And so I get there. I play with these guys. I'm a sophomore. We, we win the state championship. And the season ends and he calls me in his office one day and he says, Hey, I'm leaving here. And I think you got a chance at making it. And I'm like, you know, make it where, like, make it what? Like, I don't know what he's talking about. Cause no one in my family, you got to understand I, no one in my family has gone to college. I'm not thinking college. I'm not thinking anything. I'm just hooping. So I'm just okay. playing. Like, I don't, I'm not okay. thinking anything. I'm not thinking NBA. I'm not, I'm just thinking he goes, you got a chance at making it. And he calls up Stu Vetter. And so, and, and, you know, everyone knows Stu Vetter is one of the top five greatest high school coaches that there that there is. And so he calls him and I'm sure he was a little bit reluctant. He's like, I don't know this kid. I hadn't heard anything about him. He's not nationally ranked. I had never been to a camp. I had never been to anyone's camp or anything of that nature. So I get there and uh, Kevin Sutton is his assistant coach who's now at Kansas State and, and was the coach at high school ball at Mount Verde Academy and is a longtime college coach. And so he actually is there and they work me out. They put me through a workout and he's like, Hey coach, this kid can play. And George Lynch is already there. And Aaron Bain, their high school, all Americans, they're already there. And then I knew the world was a lot bigger than living in DC. Cause when you grow up there, you're thinking, Hey, all you think about is the city, the Southeast going up Northwest and Northeast or whatever. And, and then PG County, Northern Virginia, you think you, you know, that, that's all you need. And so transferring to that school which was a, a national school and traveling around and then I look up and I'm on one of the earlier ESPN high school games you know uh playing in a I remember it like it was yesterday the 88 uh Pine Bluff classic uh, yeah. and the number one versus number two high school ranked team in the in, in the uh in high school and I was I was so nervous it was unbelievable I was so bad I was so nervous I was so <laughs> oh, bad. I saw the clip I saw the game I was, I was so bad um, <laughs> you know it's uh, funny one thing I remember about that and I said this to Bobby Hurley late you know in recent a couple of years ago I saw him out recruiting and uh, I said to him and I told him I said you know what one of the reasons I went at you so hard in college I said, because I remember that game in 88 when we were in high school and I was terrified of you. And I knew after the game I had played so bad and I had cost our team, I felt like a, a, a high school national championship. And I said, you know what? I'll never respect anybody that much before I play them again. After the game, I'll give them their props. But before the game, I got to go at them. And so that was something that stuck for me no matter playing basketball from that point forward was like, hey, I will go at you, give you all I got. If you're the better man, you're just a better man. Now, Randolph, I, I pulled the game up on YouTube and <laughs> and I watched the intro. You didn't look nervous. You had this killer look on your face at such an early age. And you talk about being a trash talker and those things. Where did that come from? Uh, the confidence always came from my mom. You know, okay. my mom was always someone that just, you know, we started out this thing. It was just her and I against the world, it felt like. You know, it, it was, that's, that's what I remember. Um, just growing up, you know, in Southeast DC, we didn't have a lot. Spent quite a bit of time with my grandmother and my mom was just a rock. I mean, just the person that just, there was nothing. I didn't have a lot, but I didn't need anything mm. because all I needed, she, it was enough. And she, she would remind me of that, you know, what I had was enough. And so a lot of the strength and things that I think about the sacrifice and things of that may, it's like, Hey, you know what? I've had less. Uh, I, I, I don't need anything else. I, I know what it takes to, and what, it, what it's like to, to get by or, or to make the best of what you have and, and be okay with that and be happy with that. And she taught me that. So I never worried about being the biggest guy. Uh, but as you learn through life, no matter what you are, as confidence is a fragile thing that can go up and down. And, and I would lose it some, but it wouldn't be gone long. I'd get it back. And, but again, I, I, it wasn't as much as being nervous as much as I gave him so much respect. I didn't play. I was tentative in my play. 
Yeah. And, and, and that's not the way I, I believe you should play the game. And, and, and it hurt me that, that night. And it was something that going forward that I knew I'd have to change if I, if I just wanted to give my best. Everything else that came from that point forward, I had no idea it was coming. It wasn't yeah. something that I sought out. You just give it your best and wherever it happens, it just happens. And that's something I live by. Yeah, but Randolph, you were younger, man. You weren't even a singer when that happened. No, no. And, but to be on that too. stage. I'm, yeah, I am. I was, when that season started, when I was a sophomore, I was 15. Jeez. So I turned 16 in the fall. Like I left, when I walked up, when I initially walked on Wake Campus, I was 17 years old. So I, wow. you know, now in comparison to some of these older guys, I was a young guy. You know, yeah. I tease all our guys now because everybody's 50 and every, we tease and I'm the, I'm the youngest guy. I'm still, I, you know, I, I don't turn 50 till the fall. So, <laughs> uh, you know, so it, it's funny how time flies with that, but yeah, I was, I was the young guy then. And, and so it was something that um, I was always that way. You just grew up, you played, I played against older guys. I mean, you've heard yeah. older guys tell the stories about playing in a park and mm -hmm. you lose your route. I mean, everyone kind of faced that and, and growing up in that area amongst the, so many talented players year in and year out at that time, it was no different. And, and I had to, you know, in order to, to, to survive, in order to compete at that level, you had to, you had to give your best. Now I want to talk about something that happened in that eighties era uh, that occurred in that Maryland DC area. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your uh, perspective on it is the impact of the death of Lynn bias wow. at that time. Ooh, that was, uh, I, I, I would say for me, I remember where I was. Um, I remember cutting on the TV and my mom ran into my parents, my mom's bedroom and I cut her TV on and I didn't believe it. And my, uh, my childhood, one of my, my, my closest friend at the time, uh, sister used to hang out with those guys and I called him to confirm it. I actually went over his house to confirm it because he lived maybe a block away. And I ran over his house and was like, is this true? Because I knew his sister had hung out with those guys. And even though I heard it on the news, I, I didn't believe it. I cried like a baby. I mean, I cried. I, I was to me at that time, you couldn't tell me any different. If I had the opportunity to go to college and play basketball, I was going to the University of Maryland. Like Lynn Bias, it was like I, I different positions, but that was the impact. I mean, Maryland was rolling. I mean, it was yeah. it was as good as it gets. And and, and 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 if you're old enough to understand, people don't really realize how polarizing of a of an athlete that that he was. And to be in that city and be in that area and be close enough to see him and be around him, it was like it was like Jordan now. I mean, he was, he was like a God. I mean, I was, I was, I was crushed. I couldn't believe it. I, you know what it reminded me of in, in, in modern times? It reminded me of, of, of Kobe's passing in mm. the sense of you're like, it's not fair. You know, I, I remember thinking the emotions of hearing it with Kobe, the same thing, like, no, that's, that's just not possible. And then his daughter's like, Gianna, it's not possible. And then you begin to think like, it's, that's not fair. You know, there was a part of me was just saying, that's just not fair. It's not supposed to happen. And and for Lynn to be the second pick in the draft and going to a great team. I mean, he was going to a loaded Boston team. I mean, it was there would be a there, there things would be a lot different. There'd be a lot more championships hanging in Boston had he been able to to play. And so I, I was I was shook. I mean, I'd be lying to you about it. I mean, yeah. I, I was he was someone that I grew up just like in awe of just mesmerized, but everything that he did. Randolph, during that time when you were in high school, the Big East, the ACC, uh, they were the top two conferences. And again, growing up in that area, being a Maryland fan, fan, what was it that separated Wake Forest for you and your choice and your recruiting process? What was the thing that tipped Wake Forest over the top considering the other options that you had I mean you pretty could you could have gone anywhere right. so you know there had to be something about Wake yeah you know what's funny uh what tipped me to Wake had nothing to do with Wake it had everything to do with that phone call that George left was made that I went to Flint Hill Prep and I struggled in public school I wasn't focused a lot I mean I was one of those kids begging for extra credit to make sure I got a C so I could be eligible to 
to play basketball. Um, when I got that, when I made that phone call and, and Coach Left, which made the phone call to Stu Vetter, and I went to Flint Hill Prep, it was a private school. Now, I went from this public school with thousands of kids to this private school where my graduating class might have been 27 people, 25 people, <laughs> or something like that. Like, I'm talking, my, my ratio was seven. My, my ratio, my student, my teacher, to, you know, my student to teacher ratio was like seven to one. Right. Yeah. So there wasn't much goofing around. It was just like you couldn't you couldn't just disappear in that or not be seen or not be around. You know, you were you were visible. And then being an athlete, being there, uh, you know, you stood out even more. So that was it. And yeah. I, I went from a kid that struggled to get a two point GPA. to I was an honor roll student. I'm three, seven, three. I mean, I'm, I'm just like cruising. I mean, it was just and I enjoyed it. And so. Yeah. When it got time for me to go to college, as you know, Big East was big. And so John Thompson was, you know, I was fortunate enough to be recruited by the legendary John Thompson. He knew my parents and uh, we used to play the summer leagues up at Georgetown. So Georgetown was the Big East school and PJ Calissimo and, and the uh, Seton Hall Pirates had just made it to the finals. Uh, and so those were my two my, in my final five, Coach Vetta was like, I couldn't go past five. He had it, it to narrow my five down. And yeah. I was a late signee. I, I just didn't understand what any of that really was and what it was like. I was just kind of saying, all right, let me figure this out. Like, I don't know. I felt like it was the biggest decision of my life. And what was I going to do about it? So I had been to Maryland and Georgetown enough. So those were local schools that I had been on their campuses a million times. And that was Gary Williams' first recruiting class. And so many okay. of us had talked about from, I remember uh, I've said this story before, uh, Stefan Marbury's older brother, Norman Marbury, Link, played at Lincoln High School in New York. And, and I had played against him in a high school game and a couple of all met guys, Mike Smith, who played in the NBA, Dickie Simpkins, and a few of us all met guys were talking about just going to Maryland, kind of continuing that. And they were put on probation for the Bob Wade incident. And Gary Williams called me and they pulled me out of class. And he said, hey, I think you got a chance at making it. And we're going to be banned from TV. And I don't think that's fair to you. So I think you should go somewhere else. And I'm like, wow. Uh, like, OK. And so I didn't go to Maryland. And my five schools were Maryland, Georgetown. But conference wise, or, or Big East wise, it was Georgetown and, uh, and Seton Hall. And it was Seton Hall because, again, the story I told you about going to Flint Hill being so small, Seton yeah. Hall was the smallest school in the Big East. So I thought, again, no one in my family had graduated. So I that told me I would thrive academically in a smaller environment. So Seton Hall wasn't good years before, but with that year with PJ, they were really good. So that was my reason for saying, hey, I'll go to the Seton Hall, Maryland yeah. and Georgetown because they were local. And in North Carolina, because there's North Carolina and George Lynch, my high school teammate, had just gone there. And Dean Smith was really good friends with my high school coach. And the other school was Wake. And it wasn't that Wake was very good. Um, I remember <laughs> making a commitment. And uh, obviously, I take my visits to both schools. And it just, yeah. it just fit. I mean, I couldn't tell you anything. I didn't know anything about it. I knew, I've heard the stories at the time, like Muggsy had went there and, I remember doing that year. They were oh, and it felt like a hundred <laughs> doing the ACC play. <laughs> and, uh, they ended up winning. I think they won the last three games of the ACC season, and then they played Clemson with Dale Davis and those guys in the ACC tournament, and they lost. And I remember uh, seeing some of my buddies, and they're like, "Man, they suck. Why are you going there? Like, you don't want to go there." Uh but again, that decision was made easy for me. And I felt like I could, I could be a part of something because I had met a guy and I shared this story the other night uh, at the alumni, uh, at the alumni uh, gathering with, for Rodney. I had never been in any camps in my life. And the one camp I get to was this Nike Invitational camp. And so I get to this camp and the who's who is there. So all the guys are doing our time from kid to Weber to Rodney, you know, we were all, every, everybody's there. It's invitation only. It used to be at Princeton, I think. So this is the first camp I've ever been to. And I saw, I saw this guy, I saw this lefty, this big, you know, cartoon character, Thor looking <laughs> freaking nature coming in there playing. 
And so I met him, and he actually played on the team. He was Charles Harrison, Charlie Moe's teammate. So when you're not playing, you're watching your guys. So I'm watching other guys, and I'm watching him, and he's just – he's rotten. And I remember reading and seeing that he was from North Carolina and then that he was being recruited by Wake. And so he had committed it earlier, and I knew then. I was like, hey, with a guy like that, we, we can't need a whole lot. You know, it, yeah. I think he and I could get some guys in there and win some games. And so between the, to be honest, the, the small school academically and Rodney Rogers are the reasons I became a deacon. Speaking of Rodney Rogers, uh, what was it like when you got on campus and you get to play with this guy? Uh, well, I'm sorry, not this guy, this man. Yeah. First of all, <laughs> let me tell you this. You couldn't tell me nothing. You hear me? When I tell you, <laughs> I, I walk on campus, I'm 6'1", 170, 75 pounds, and I could have been, you'd have thought I was Rodney Rogers 2.0. I had him, <laughs> I had Trelawney Owens, I had Anthony Tucker, I had Chris King, Phil Metlin. I mean, I got 6'10", 6'8". You couldn't tell me nothing. I mean, it was it wasn't just basketball. I was like, I got pro. Oh, you uh, hey 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 hey, you know I, I'm calling my guys. Like that was that was uh, wow. I mean, he was. I, I've said this again. The best athlete that's ever walked on that campus, present day, best best athletes have walked on campus. I mean, he just was. Didn't touch weight. I actually get in trouble because he didn't have to lift. He didn't have to go in the weight room. They didn't even bother to mess with me. He didn't like, he's like, oh, I mess with my shot. So he didn't, you know, he's kind of, I ain't doing no weights. I ain't doing. And they would, they would want him to go, but he was already like two, six, yeah. seven, two sixty, just a smooth athletic dude. He was just big. He was Zion before Zion, but he was chiseled. He wasn't, you know, he was in far better shape in that aspect. And, you know, lefty smooth and just phenomenal athlete, man. He was just, a, and a great guy. He was absolutely salt of the earth guy. And so, you know, I, I just didn't, so I, when you, when you have that around you and you mm -hmm. take Mark Blugas and Stan King or Trelawney Owens and Robert Dogger, that class comes in. And then you had other guys that were talented. You had Anthony Tucker, who's a DC guy. You had Chris King. You had Phil Metlins, you had uh, Rob Silo, who was there, mm. Derek McQueen. You had guys that was there. And then you brought these freshmen that knew how to win. And it just meshed. And we just took off from, from the very beginning. It wasn't easy, <laughs> yeah. that, but we took off. Where were you when you got the call about Rodney's accident? Mm. Um, I was in Milan. I was playing in Veracity and I was in Milan. And I remember Odom and Jody Puckett called me. And I can tell you, I remember it like it was yesterday. I got the call and uh, he said to me, Rodney was in an accident. And I'm like, okay. Like I, I just talked to him and, you know, he's, he's okay. And, and he said, uh, I'm like, what? It was kind of like I'm waiting him to tell me, like, I just, what was going on? And he's telling me, he gets real technical. He's like, well, Rodney broke the the so-and-so vertebrae, and he named it. And I'm getting this. And I'm like, what What? What does that mean? Like, I don't understand what you're talking about. What What does that mean? Like, stop getting, I'm not a doctor. Tell me what does it mean? And he said, Rodney's paralyzed from the neck down. And I, I just started crying. And uh, I hung up the phone and I, 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 I sat in that, I sat in a chair. I never moved. I didn't move for hours. I just sat there. I was in disbelief. I couldn't believe it. I just didn't think it was true. And uh, to hear, to call back and to, the, to, to, to hear the commotion in the background and everything that was going on. And um, there was so much with, with, I think people, when I talk about Rodney, I get emotional and I did at the alumni dinners because he's the people look at him now and his, 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 his fight and who he is. And he's <laughs> always been that guy, but I can assure you what no one, I don't know if anyone has gone through as much as Rodney Rogers has gone through. And, and, and I, I don't feel comfortable sharing everything because it's not my story to tell. 
but I can assure everyone from being as close to him as I am, no one, no one has gone through. Uh, people just look at him physically and think, oh, they feel sorry. And then, you know, no, he, he's, if he hadn't been paralyzed, he's gone through more than the average person has ever gone through. And he is, and I, I say it by far, he's the strongest human being I've ever met. He's, 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 there's, there's just, there's just no other person like him that I've ever been around that I've ever met. I've heard stories, things that the people are unfortunate, but not nothing like Rodney's. Rodney's story is just something that you would, it'd bring you to tears no matter who you are. It took That's me a long awesome, time man. to get over that. It took me a long time to get over it. I, 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 I still cry sometimes when I talk about him. I, I'm unapologetic about that. Uh, some of it is tears of joys because I'm proud of who he is and his fight. And, and, and he's always been that guy. I think it took me a long time to see him. I flew home. I flew to Atlanta, the Shepherd Center to see him. And he's in there and <laughs> he's, he's just, it was, he's, he's just a one of a kind human being. He really is. Now you didn't have it quite easy no. uh, while you were at wake yourself. Uh, you had a season ending knee injury right. and what did you learn about Randolph Childress, the person mm -hmm. during that time when you had to deal with that injury? I thought it was over. I thought it was over back then. Now it, it changes nothing. It seems as though ACL injuries, it gives you an example how far things have come. ACL injuries doesn't slow down anything. Now guys are getting drafted and, you know, top 15 picks or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't change much with them. Back then you thought it was over and uh, coming in as a freshman, you know, Rodney won freshman of the year. I was runner up freshman of the year and had yeah. a really good freshman year, you know, and we're over it now in the Sutton center and we're playing pickup for camp. You know, we had the overnight camp going on and, um, uh, I'm running the left wing and I get the ball and I, and I catch him. I get go up for a layup and I felt this pain. I heard this pop and I felt this pain and I'll train it with Scott street and I'm banging on the floor and I'm like, Scott, Scott, Scott. I go downstairs and uh, they take us in the training room, which is now I think the pool, <laughs> but they take me downstairs in the training room and they draw this tube out and it's a tube of blood. And he says, they give me the ACL test. And he says, I think you tore your ACL. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Like, what is that? And Robert Seiler again was a senior on that team my freshman year. And he had this old, you know, that old school brace. And people don't know when you tore your ACL back then, you had that, that brace that you start walking in right now. And it's from your hip down to your ankle. That's what you have. And Rob had this massive brace that he used to have to play in. And I'm thinking, man, there's no way, you know, I could can play in that thing. And that's what I'm thinking and hearing. All I kept hearing about was how good of an athlete and what Rob Siley used to be. And not like, oh, he's, re he's going to recover. He's going to do this. It was just like, oh, he was unbelievable. He was such a great athlete. Like it was past tense. Like you couldn't recover from it. And so, I was, I was crushed, man. I thought it was over. I, I, I cried, you know, the same thing, you know, you live and you learn. It was like the, why me, why me? And it's funny how God works in, this, in such an amazing way. Jerry Wainwright, who's longtime wake assistant and coach, longtime head coach in, in, in uh, college basketball used to give me articles of like, I didn't know Michael Irvin had tore his ACL. And he had sent me so many other players that had come back from the injury. I get to the hospital, unbelievable amount of support. People are coming up to the hospital. And so I had my own room. So I, it, it was, I mean, it was, it was as if I'm, I'm handing out something, you know, I'm free. I mean, it was just, it was nothing to see 10 or 15 people in the room. Well, my fever wouldn't break. I had my fever and I couldn't get my fever down. So they said, Hey, we got to get you a roommate because the, the doctor said, Hey, get him a roommate because by then, the nurses knew that if you had a roommate, it would enforce the rule that you only had two people in your room. And originally I had a room to myself. So I'm sitting there at the time and uh, I'm in and out with med meds for painkillers and I'm, I wake up, Coach Wayne Wright and his wife are there. And the nurse, they're like, hey, we're gonna bring you a roommate in today. And they bring this guy in and I'm pretty sure his name was Mr. Anderson. And they bring him in and he has his legs missing. 
And I'm in the process of my feeling sorry for myself crying. And then they wheel him in and he's missing a leg. And I'm just watching him go across and they, I kept my room on the right and they wheel him in and put him to my left. And I, I never cried again. I, I just couldn't anymore. I'm like, I'm sitting here crying and I'm going to walk. I'm going to play. I'm going to run. I'm going to shoot. I don't know how well I'm going to do it, but I know I'm going to do it. And I'm looking at this guy that will never do those things. And so I was, I remember that. And I knew then like, all right, that was the last time I cried. And it was like, all right. And, it, and, it, and it's funny, I adopted this to, to, to people and players that I've coached and people around me and say, when we've gone through something difficult like this, it's like, hey, you know what? We're going to cry about it. We're going to cry. We're going to talk about it. We're going to cry. But when we wake up tomorrow, we're going to attack it. So we get tonight, let's get this all out. And that's what that, that's where it came from. It came from, hey, what am I crying for? You know, this guy's going to be, and you know who, you know, it's a it's funny story. You know who, uh, who that guy's related to? Who? Cat Stevens. Randy? Call Randy and ask Randy about it. Wow. Randy, Randy took a bus trip. Randy took a trip. <clears throat> One of his early trips when he first got to wake, we're at Boston College. And he says to me, he says, Randolph, uh, you may not remember this. This is how he, he sits maybe one row beside me. He had his son. I think his son might have been on a trip with him. He sits in either the next seat next to me or the row behind me. And he says, hey, you don't remember this. He said, but you were in a hospital with my uncle. And I, before he said it, I started talking about it. And I told him, I said, I'll never forget him. And it's 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 Randy Cass Stevens' uncle. Wow! You come back from your injury, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I, <laughs> that's that's how small this world is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I ne I will yeah. never forget him, and never forget what that. And, and I want I want to say I think his story was something sad. I think he had maybe lost a son or daughter or something, and was driving. His wife had become medicated or something like that, and he was driving mm -hmm. to get the medication on a motorcycle or something like that and it was an accident and he lost his leg but i can assure you when i i, I was crying and that sorry and that that pity party crap and when i saw him come in it was it was like no and and wayne right now and i talked and it was like hey we're gonna cry tonight this is gonna be over when we wake up yeah. tomorrow we start this process of turning the page and getting back to being you know who whatever randolph chose is gonna be so uh, Randolph, you come back from the injury, you fight mm -hmm. back, you battle mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. and you're ready to play. Right. And you start hearing about this kid named Tim Duncan. Right. What was your first impression the first time you actually got to meet Tim? I'm wasting my time. <laughs> I'm wasting my time. Like, <laughs> you got to realize <laughs> the, the, the... <laughs> older I'm. Coach Odom would be the person I was, I was meant to play for him. And you, you hear people say very few coaches see a person for who they are and say, I'm going to let you be you. But every now and then I need you to, there's going to be times I'm going to challenge you. I need you to evolve. I need you to grow. But he would, he, I wasn't the person that needed to be motivated. I was there. I was, I was on 10 every day. I'm getting up. And so, when it came to recruiting, as I got older, I would say, hey, don't give me nobody unless you want them. Like sometimes you got kids on campus. I ain't, I ain't wasting my time with nobody. If you really want this kid, then, then all right, then let me take him out. If he just a kid visiting, let one of those other guys take him. So even when the guy signed, I wouldn't hang around them because I had, if they weren't, I was never going to be close to people that wasn't serious about basketball. And, and then, so Tim comes in there and I'm a junior and I'm just sitting here, you know, you got to realize I had, you know, Rodney Rogers and, 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 and Chris King and, and Anthony Tucker. I mean, we had pro, we had good players. I mean, guys that was in the gym and we were a tough physical team and you get guys in there and they just didn't figure it out. And if freshmen came in there and they weren't ready to go or they didn't take it serious. Oh, I was like, I can't, I can't play him. 
and, and, and it worked because, I mean, seriously, and I would go to guys and I would tell guys, oh, you're not going to play. You better figure this out before the season. Like, I would go in the gym and watch the guys play pickup and say stuff like, hey, man, you better get rid of that or you better start doing this because come the fall, you ain't going to play. So so you brought that Mamba mentality before the Mamba oh, mentality. Well, so it's really the Randolph Childress no, no, mentality. No, 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 no. Forget the Mamba, <laughs> you, because you were beforehand. I mean, no, you, was, you coming at no guys, guys and stuff. Man, Mike and guys are that way. But you know, it's funny. It's just the leadership style that it wasn't for everybody, and it's not. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and you've had it, and you see it in so many different people. They can call it whatever they want, but certain guys are that way. It's like Chris is that way. Mm. Chris rubs a lot of people wrong because he, he, he prepares and works so hard that that's the only way he knows. So if you're goofing around and you're not putting forth the effort, you and Chris ain't going to get along. And I was that way. Yeah. So when we had younger guys, it would be like, hey, all right, him, you, you, they can come over here. You, you just stay over there. And so getting Tim, he just slid right in. I mean, it was now, <laughs> again, the first time I see this guy before he commits, he, we used to go to the IHOP. It's still the same IHOP <laughs> building right across from the, yep. from the Coliseum, right? Yep. So back then it was the International House of Pancakes and we go there and this is official visit. And uh, they heard the stories. You know, I know you by now you heard all the stories about his recruiting, but that was my first kind of meeting with him. It's cold. Uh, it's raining outside. It's chilly. And, and, and so he, he comes on his visit. He's coming from the islands and he doesn't have anything. So he's sitting there at breakfast. And this is how he's sitting there. He's got his arms in his shirt. He's sitting there, he's sitting there at breakfast like this. Now he's 6'10. He's 6'11, right? So I'm sitting there like, man, this big soft ass dude, man. I can't. You got me in here. He's rubbing his arms. Like, where's his coat? Like, he's sitting there, he's flapping his sleeves. It's like he like he playing little kid games. I'm sitting there like he said, man. Where's his coat? I'm like, what? <laughs> Cause it's <laughs> it was cold out there. I'm like, what is he doing? Like, what's he doing? So I, I, I was just expecting a little bit more than that. And, and uh, you know, and then he, you know, he obviously commits and he was supposed to have been playing with Mac Tarinjai and, and Ricky Peral, who were the big names of that class. And yeah. Mac Tarinjai had played at, uh, at Oak Hill with, with Stackhouse and McGinnis. So okay. they were number one in the country. I'm not expecting Tim to play. So I'm looking at him like, you stay on the other side with the mother bums. I ain't got time for that. I don't have enough eligibility enough to wait on you to be good. So you stay over there. So the ruling comes down, Maktar is ineligible. And then Ricky Peral, you know, sanctions come down that he misses a year or whatever. He couldn't play. But prior to all that, before we even find this out, again, we're in the gym watching these guys play pickup. And you see it. You see it. So Blucas, Mark Blucas, my buddy, he, he was similar to that, like a hard nosed, you know, you know, Pennsylvania guy winner. And, I, and we would sit there and watch. And I'm like, all right, this kid, you know, this kid's pretty good. You know, he starts snatching rebounds, going coast to coast, throwing it behind his back and laying it up and all this. And I'm like, man, like this kid and all they're talking about is, oh, we're going to redshirt him. He's not going to play. He's not going to play because the coaches couldn't be in the gym. It's like, oh, he's never going to play. And we're like, I'm like, shh. <laughs> hey, this kid, listen to me. This kid's pretty good. They're like, no, he's not ready for the bigs in this league. The Joe Smiths, the Wayne Buckinghams, the, you know, all Sharon Wrights, and, you know, yeah. you're naming all this, the, the Eric Montross, you know, you're naming all these bigs in the league. He's not ready for these guys. And, you know, he, 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 I've never seen a guy go from where he started to, to to what he became but he worked his he worked his ass off i mean he was a before practice after practice guy and at that point i <laughs> he had trelawney owens to help him as a freshman mm -hmm. and by the end of that he became like a double double guy you know he was giving us like 10 and 10 and i remember my the beginning of my senior year and his uh his sophomore year <laughs> we were playing davidson and odom early in the year odom was calling me he called me to the front of the bus. He said, look, these first couple of games, we're going to win. And we're in non-conference. He says, hey, but let's play through Tim. We got to get some balance. I need to see if, if he can be that guy for us. We got to find someone down there. And I'll never forget, we played Davidson. And uh, Tim might have had 30 and 20. So, <laughs> I mean, there's some ridiculous numbers. Like somebody yeah. can remember. I know somebody can look it up and remember. It was a Davidson his freshman year. 
but it also is after we lost in that Alaska shootout, which is his first game, which we lost, and you were ready to send his ass back to St. Croix at that point. <laughs> he was like, you're trash. Get out of here. Go back to be a swimmer. But that <laughs> that game, that Davidson game, I get on the bus and I go in the back and sit down and Odom calls me back in his seat and he says, you remember what I told you about you don't have to be as aggressive because we were looking for balance. He said, I think we got him. You can go ahead back and, and, and start being aggressive. And, you know, and if you watch that senior year, we started out a little slow and then things picked up and, uh, Ultimately, you know, the thing that turned that season around was Tony Rutland losing his mom and uh, Tim sharing stories who had just lost his mom a few years prior to that at Florida State. And we were sitting there crying and, and, and talking about it. And everybody was just kind of just sitting there. The game didn't matter. And uh, we went on a run and we didn't lose another game the rest of the season until we lost and ultimately in the Elite Eight or whatever it was. But uh, you know, to go to the Elite Eight, and, and, and that was a big reason why. Randolph, that was a historic season, man. I mean, uh, watching you guys that season, that, that 95 season, and I want to fast forward to the ACC tournament. Mm -hmm. And uh, many have described that as uh, the greatest 48 hours, the greatest 72 hours in ACC tournament history in terms of, of your play, the points. I mean, you scored over 100 points in a weekend. When I played basketball, I didn't score 100 points in a season. So to see what you were able to do. And so I want to talk first about the infamous crossover. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to know, it wasn't the crossover move. I've seen, you know, that's that's expected. But when you turned and told him to get up, what I want to know is, what did he say to you before the game? Because you only do that to somebody you don't like. You're not going to do that to a friend. He was no friend of yours no. at all. No. So <laughs> when you put that move on him, did, did that change the energy of the team? I don't think so. And I was so dialed in, in a sense, I, I don't, when I did it, it wasn't anything. I, I wasn't thinking about a move or him falling or anything else. I was so mad at him. And again, going back to the early part of the season, we had, I had freshman guards, right? I had Timmy inside who's only a sophomore, but the guys that I played with on the perimeter was Tony Rutland and Jerry Braswell. Yeah. They were freshmen. And Rusty, who was in football at the time, Rusty hadn't came, mm -hmm. come, you know, he hadn't come over yet. Yeah. And, or just, you know, wasn't in basketball shape yet. So these two guys are there and I'm, I'm every day kind of taking them. I'm grabbing them like, look, under my wing, this is what we got to do. And, and they're playing. So, it's we get to the Carolina game and we're playing in Winston. Donna Williams was a heck of a player and a, and a really good score on their team. Mm -hmm. And the way we were matching up was Odom wanted me to guard. He would let Tony kind of run around and take whoever the other guy was. But the last 10 minutes of the game, I always drew the assignment on whoever was the other the top guard on the other team. transition happened i can't get on him i'm, I'm at the top i'm guarding the guinness and donna williams get loose and hits a shot put them up and we didn't always call a timeout odin would just mm -hmm. tell guys if it's under five i think we had a rule where it was under five or six get the ball inbounds to me go up and try to make a play get the ball push it up miss a shot at the buzzer and i remember the next day someone came up to me and was like, did you hear what Jeff McGinnis said? I'm like, what did you say? He said he knew if he kept the game close, we'd choke. Oh, wow. I grew up under where if it's a close game and you call yourself a really good guard, it's on you to win the game. Like, that's on you. And I'm like, choke. I'm like, man, I ain't never choking. I'm like, I've lost games, but I ain't never been afraid. That, you know, that. so I was so angry. Like, I had that game circled up. I had that game circled. People, don't, people talk about the, champ, the ACC championship game. We had just played them the week before in yeah. uh, in Chapel Hill. So senior night was NC State at home. It was the game before senior night. So it's literally the week before the ACC tournament. And we play them in Chapel Hill. And I'm like, we got this. We're going to get this. 
Like, we're going to get this, and I'm going to go at them. And I went at them that night. And we went in Chapel Hill, and, you know, we come home, we win senior night, and then we go to the, to that tournament. So in on that move, I'm thinking this is the same guy that said I choked him. And he put yeah. it in an article. So, I mean, he said it to yeah. a reporter. So I'm thinking, yeah. okay, I choked? All right. So when he fell, I was, I'm telling you, and I remember it like it was, if if Stackhouse didn't run at me from the baseline, I would have waited for him to get up. Like that's how angry I was. Like, 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 get up. Like, come on. And then Stackhouse started running, and then I raised up and shot it. But but I was, it was just to send a message to him. They're like, man, you, you, you can say a lot of things, but I choking, or be, you know, I just I just associated choking with just being afraid of the moment or not wanting it. And I I don't think anybody would ever associate me with that. No, nah, that move, um, you would have, with the way you treated him, you would have thought he had assaulted you before the game. Okay. <laughs> you was... might as well. When you, when you tell someone that, I, I was, when you tell me I choked, that, that's the way I perceived it, to be honest. That was embarrassing. Like, I went back and I just kept watching it over and over. And I realized, I looked at the number of views. That is probably one of the most popular moves in the ACC tournament history. I mean, you're always seeing it. And I really thought he was injured. If I didn't watch the rest of the game and saw that he came back, you would have thought he blew his ACL. So I just want to know, did you apologize after the no. game? You no. should have. You don't no. do that to a person, no. Randolph. No. No. That was embarrassing. I used, to, I, I used to 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 think that. And then I realized he went to Carolina. So I like, I'm not apologizing for that. But no, seriously, he is He's a heck of a player. Yeah. You know, he became a heck of a player. And back then we could talk trash. And I think one of the reasons that that move lives in infamy is because you can't do it anymore. Because it's taunting. Oh, okay. 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 Right. And like, like you can do it and then you can't say anything. You can't tell him, get up. You can't do all yeah. that because then it'd be taunting. They'll blow the whistle. You yeah. know, and that was I, really taunting. That was actually taunting then Randolph. Yeah, that was well, taunting. Whatever, but that wasn't, we, we didn't have to live by those rules. Our rules were different back then. You know? That was nasty. That. that was nasty. <laughs> uh, so the ACC championship game, you went off. I mean, you, you, you put the team on your back. But you and I talked prior to this, and you mentioned the Duke game prior to the Carolina game right. that internally that was critical for you guys as a team. Kind of share your thoughts on – the importance and the impact of the Duke game prior to the Carolina game in the tournament? Well, people focus on the championship game. And, and again, it's like you're watching when you're watching like NBA playoffs and you're watching these teams, teams tend to, before they take the big step, a lot of times they, they have a moment and they have something that they learn from, you know, they have an experience they learn from. And we had had the year before we had a game, we should have beat Carolina and we lost to him, and we had had some tough games. And so in my mind, we play Virginia one year, we lose to Virginia, and it's a back and forth game. And I just kept thinking of these, the way we, we had lost these games in the past. That's all I kept thinking was like, man, we got to get off to a good start. We got, and we do everything but that. Dude comes out, they're hitting everything, and we're down. We're the number one seed. And we're down 31-13, I think, by the second TV timeout. I mean, it was like – and I had a turnover. I, I just remember our bench being back here, and we're going down the court. Mm -hmm. And I lose the ball and have a turnover. And I just remember my mother sitting in the stands up there. I knew where she was. And I just remember looking up to her like, I, there's no way – like, I can let this happen. Like, this can't happen. Like, it's not like, like it can't happen. Like, we, we've been this, this connected team all year long. And so I just said, hey, you know what? If I'm going to lose, then I'm going to lose giving it everything I had. And people talk about the Carolina game or the actual championship. That – there's an eight minute stretch of that Duke game. I think I made 10 straight shots mm -hmm. and that was, I was as dialed in as focused because this, the, and I say this all the time. The reason I was able to be that way too, is because my teammates were, were they're like here, 
shoot it again. Like they wanted me to to have the ball <clears> in those moments. So those were the things that I remember about that group and everybody else. But that Duke game was was the one was the game that kind of propelled us through. And and, and we once we responded from that. I mean, we went from losing by 18 to up at the half, and then we went it running away. I mean, there was a a 40 point swing, and you don't do that against any any Duke team. That's just something that just doesn't happen, and that's something that we did that year. To your point of why it was so special. So Randolph, you have this great college career, mm-hmm. and you played with so many other great players. But you're doing your thing. It, it isn't from the outside. I'll just say it was never a question of your leadership and, and sort of whose team it was in a sense. Mm-hmm. What was it like for you to get that call on draft day after you put in the work in college? I mean, you had all of the accolades and you had won the titles. And so now it's this NBA opportunity that, you know, everyone you dreamed of, right. what was it like when you got that call that you had gotten drafted, that you had got heard your name? the most nerve wracking experience <laughs> of your life. It is unbelievable. Um, I remember wanting to be with my family and friends and we were yeah. at our house. It was that was at my parents' house. We had a bunch of people over and I got a call from one of the coaches with the Sacramento Kings. And they were, I want to say they're the 12th pick or something like that. And they're like, hey, um, we're looking to take you or we're going to take Corliss Williamson. Right now, the room is split 2-2. Two, two. We'll let the owner make the decision. Assistant tells me that. So he says, I think we're leaning toward you or whatever. So I'm sitting there at this point because I'm starting to hear, like, this is where I know I'm getting ready. I, I'm, I'm hearing I am can go anywhere in, in this range. So my phone rings, and I take the call, and I get that information it goes the other way. And Sacramento was my first workout. That was the first workout I had. I, I worked out with them before I had ever left. You know, I flew out of Greensboro then. You know, I left there and flew out to Cali. And and, and so I remember the workout vividly and, and it went well. So I thought, you know, and Bobby Hurley was there and unfortunately had just had his severe life altering uh, 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 auto wreck and so I don't know what's what's gonna happen, but I, you know, I felt good about the workout, and and so I, the name comes up, it's not me, and I, <laughs> at that point, I was just like, wow, and I don't remember the next picker here, or there was, I no one I had worked out with or had talked to, so, I actually went outside. I had a couple of dogs. I had a couple of Rockwallers, and I grabbed my dogs and just said, hey, I'm going for a walk. I can't sit here and watch this, so I grabbed the leashes and I started going for a walk. And uh, I stayed outside. I came back to the house and I got a call. And they like, hey, 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 you know, leading up to the pick. And I, I think it was Doug Collins or it was someone else that called me and said, hey, we're going to, Portland's going to draft you. Or Detroit's going to draft you, but they're drafting you for us and we're going to trade you to Portland. And, you know, it, it, just like before they announced any trade on TV, they kind of called me and told me what was going on. And then that was, so it was more of a relief. Okay. When it finally happened, you know, I felt more like, ah, like you finally, you know, you finally did it. And so it reminds me of like winning the ACC championship in a sense, you know, we, we won it in 95 and everyone was celebrating that, but every year we was there, we had a good enough team to win it. So I felt a sense of relief. Like we finally did it, you know, okay. hand. like we got the monkey off our back and being drafted is, is that way. I mean, you, 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 you put all, you know, you, you, you work your life to get to that point. And you hear your name called. And I enjoy it now more than I did then. Okay. I, I didn't enjoy it as much then. It was just nerve wracking and everything about it. And and, uh, and to, to be in that position, you, you know, you spend more time kind of just, I was one of those people. And even as an adult, I had to learn to change. I spent so much time focused on the next thing. It was like, what's next? All right, what's next? What's next? What's next? Yeah. That I had to learn to sometimes stop and enjoy the roses and to say, hey, you know what? You, you've you've done some pretty cool stuff in this lifetime. So let's, let's, let's enjoy it. Now, Randolph, you made the jump from college to the pros. Mm -hmm. You go from 20 plus games this season to 82. What was that like? Just the, 
the the basics of, of shifting from college basketball to pro basketball and now you've got an 82 game season you have all of these other things coming at you what was your rookie year like in terms of just making the basic adjustment just something from the number of games all right <laughs> to tell the whole story of that i have to go back to the acc tournament the biggest thing that made the tournament so strong was and people at practice would know this so my junior year, they had the select team, which was the um, USA basketball was supposed to play against the dream team. And I was on this college select team that's supposed to play. But I had my workout and I was training to, to get ready for that. But I wasn't disciplined enough to continue to do that. There were some students over on the other side of Reynolds gym. So I took they had two courts running both ways. I took one of the courts and was like, hey, guys, I'm working out on this court. You guys go over there. And so they were running pickup over there, and they were running a half court game on the other end. And I was just using chairs and doing stuff that I was, you know, kind of – I had called my high school coach, Kevin Sutton, and was like, give me some stuff to work on. And I was doing these workouts to get ready for that. Got bored with it and undisciplined and said, hey, man, I just want to play. So I go down there and play with the regular students on campus. And one of the students go down, and I slap the ball – and my shoulder pops out. So they fix up orthoscopically. And that summer, did it give me enough time to recover to be ready in the fall for my senior year? I make it all the way through the senior year. And the last game of the season, we played senior night against NC State, which was my probably my biggest memory of anything at Wake Forest. The greatest day for me at Wake Forest until probably Brandon came was when my senior night happened, no one left the building. And they retired my jersey on my <laughs> senior night. It wasn't a comeback or whatever. It's the most unbelievable. I I can't tell you. You have to ask somebody. It was the most. Um, NC State coach and players came back out and sat on the bench. It was 14-5 in the Joel. It was un believable and uh so that was like i said that was one of those, those experience so right after we finished that practice the first practice leading up to the acc tournament no issues all year my shoulder pops up and i run out of the gym i'm grabbing my shoulder and i'm running to the training room and they you know they pop it back in and i remember odom saying this doesn't leave this this gym don't tell anybody. Kevin, I don't touch a basketball all week until the Duke game. I don't practice. I don't do anything. Anyone that knows that has shoulder injuries, your shoulder pop out. You can't get it up past this is as high as you're going to get it for the first day. And then each day I started getting my range of motion back. I never, I, I didn't do anything until that game. And after the Duke game, in the locker room, I remember asking Odom, and I said, hey, did, did anybody find out about my shoulder injury? And he said, no. He said, you just score 40, son. They're going to ask. They're going to tell you put out because <laughs> you shot too much. <laughs> that was his response. <laughs> but I said it to say, so I get through that, and, and I'm having some issues. And, and so as I'm training, even getting ready for workouts, I, I, it was like a Mel Gibson thing. I, it, it was popping out in and out so much that I can just be laying down and wake up and it'd be like, oh, it's out, you know, like grab it, you know. And, and so I would, I learned then, I knew I, if I just relaxed and then I would grab my elbow, I could slip it back into place. So it, it, it was popping out so much that it was just like, and uh, my second or third game in my NBA career, I went to sit in one of those chairs, you know, how like you got a chair and the bottom of it and you kind of got it, you know, you, 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 the bottom of it kind of folds down. Yeah. You know, you fold yeah. It down. I went and I placed my hand on the bottom of it and it folded, but I was leaning. So I had all my momentum getting ready to lean back in this chair and it folded on me. And I went right to the ground and the top part of the chair hit me on the inside of the arm as I was falling, popped my shoulder out. And uh, it, it had popped out so many times up until that point. It was so bad. I think I made it to 
maybe November or December my rookie year, and then it was like, all right, you got going to the knife again. And so that time they had to split me open and and and, and you know cut me open to, to fix that. And I, I was my body, I, my confidence is shaking. My body was kind of breaking. You're talking about someone who had who was. 21, 22 years old, I'd had two shoulder surgeries, an ACL, a broken nose, broken fingers. I just was questioning physically doing the 90s at that time anyway, which was so physical. I didn't know if I could I could, I could, could hang handle it. I couldn't. I, I didn't know if my body would allow me to play anymore. I, I had those concerns and questions, and I um, was just – it was just – for the first time as a basketball player, my confidence was just rattled because I had doubt like and I that was something that that in all those moments we talked about before there's there's lessons that I learned in them but I was always pretty confident and I get to the NBA and physically was the first time I started losing my confidence as a player wow. and that was just such a big part of me <laughs> of who I am and who 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 you know you just you just play the game with confidence and let the results be and then I, I had those results. I had that concern. I had the doubt. I was just like, man, I don't know if I can do this because I just couldn't, I, I, you know, it was a third, it was a second surgery and there's another one. It's another year gone. And I had already missed two years. And remember I hadn't started playing until I was 13, 14 years old. And I had already, you know, so in the, in a seven year span, I'd missed two years. Wow. 